Since the beginning of human history, societies have been divided into different levels, or strata. We see this stratification in the temple murals of ancient Egypt, in the wall tapestries of medieval Europe, in the paintings of Renaissance masters, and in the works of 20th century artists. In each case, there are those who hold wealth, power, and status, and those who don't. This is social stratification. When the Titanic hit an iceberg one April night in 1912, social status meant everything when it came to survival. Not only did the privileged class enjoy the lavish comforts of the ballrooms and living quarters on the upper decks, they had first access to the lifeboats, which could accommodate only half the ship's passengers. In an age of chivalry, gender and age also helped that evening. Women and children were given first priority in evacuating the ship. On that night, 97% of the women and children in first class were saved. In second class, 89% of the women and children survived. But only 42% of the women and children in steerage made it to the lifeboats. Today, our chances of survival, or just living well, are also determined by our position within a social stratification system. Social stratification is the ordering of social groups or individuals, and that ordering might exist based on race and ethnicity, or that ordering might exist on, based on education, based on income, uh, based on wealth. So it's the ordering of individuals or social groups hierarchically. Although officially abolished by the Indian government in 1949, the caste system of social stratification still exists in India. It remains a rigid system, closely tied to religious and cultural beliefs. The caste system is tied up with the religion of Hinduism in India. Uh, it is very difficult for something which has been so strongly institutionalized to change in a very short period of time. If you're born into a lower caste, you're very likely to be considered uh, a, as a person who is not suitable for marriage with a person of higher caste who is excluded from certain kinds of occupations, uh, who is condemned to undertake some of the uh, most uh, dirty jobs in society. One of the uh, caste groups in India are the untouchable, and they have to follow very specific norms concerning how they relate to people who belong to other castes, such as the Brahmin caste, which is the highest one. So, for instance, they're not supposed to eat in the same dishes. The rules of intermarriage, the rules of physical contacts are very clearly defined and limiting. A society like India's that maintains rigid boundaries between social strata is said to have a closed stratification system. Another example of a closed system, which emerged during the Middle Ages, is the estate system, in which wealth and social status were determined by ownership of land. The estate system consisted of three groups. The nobility, wealthy and powerful families who owned most of the land, the clergy, because the church also owned large tracts of land, and the working class, or commoners, who supported the other two groups and did not own land. With rare exceptions, one remained in the group into which one was born. Caste and estate stratification system are fairly rigid. People cannot easily move from one group to another. Today, most societies are organized by the class system of social stratification. The class system uses specific criteria, generally income, education, and occupational prestige, to determine one's place within the system. The class system is an open stratification system because one is not forever determined 
to remain in the cast of one's birth. It's possible to move from one class position to another class uh, position, either to rise or to fall. Movement, either upward or downward, from one class to another, is driven by a variety of factors. These include education, personal effort, and economic conditions. When the available jobs of a middle or upper middle class nature increase, that creates opportunities for people who are lower in the class system to arise. In addition to upward social mobility, downward social mobility can be often thrust upon someone by outside forces. For instance, we've had a very deep and swift change in moving from a manufacturing society to a more service-oriented economy. The manufacturing jobs were much more well-paid, they were often unionized, they had much more secure benefits, whereas the service economy is much less well-paid, many fewer benefits, and often temporary work. And so a person might now be making much less as the economy has changed around him or her. All right, what if I raise it to 20 bucks? Education is another factor in movement within the class structure. Education is probably one of the main determinants of upward mobility in this country. In a class system, mobility is created in a number of ways, the first of which perhaps is the most important is the investment by the individual in his or her own uh, stocks of capital, what we call, we think about capital oftentimes just financially, but capital can also be what we call often human capital, or the investment in education. Personal effort also plays a significant role as individuals strive to move from one class to another. Mobility might be achieved through networking, through creating social ties with people in other social class groups, and learning of new opportunities through that way. Social stratification has always been a part of the human experience. Until modern times, most people remained in the social strata of their parents. Today, instead of birth, class systems are largely based on income, education, and occupation. Social mobility has become a possibility for millions. We can all agree that social stratification, like death and taxes, is a fact of life. But why is that so? Over the years, sociologists have explored that question by using the sociological perspectives, conflict, functionalism, and interactionism. Each perspective offers a somewhat different answer. Early conflict theory stemmed from the Marxist belief that conflict between the haves and have-nots would eventually lead to revolutions that would establish classless socialist societies. But today, the idea of a classless society appears to be an impossible dream in practice. Modern sociological theory even argues that class stratification is necessary for a healthy, functioning society. The difference between uh, what we have today and uh, in industrialized societies and what Marx anticipated, the most important difference is the emergence of a very large middle class, which uh, works in service occupations, is highly educated, has substantial human capital. Uh, they don't own a great deal of property, but they certainly see themselves as very different from the uh, kind of workers who are engaged in manual work and the uh, work in more industrial, classical industrial type of occupations. Marx had not yet thought about the incredible diversification between producers or laborers or people working in factories and the owners of those factories. He didn't think about teachers who so in some ways own their own labor but in some ways don't own their own labors. Today, conflict theorists focus on the inequality of power that exists in a society. Conflict theorists believe that wherever you have inequalities of power, you will have a basis of conflict between those who exercise power and those who do not exercise power. And since they believe that power is an important ingredient in most social institutions, they see at least the foundation of conflict uh, within them. From a functionalist perspective, there are good reasons for social stratification. 
The functionalists believe that the kinds of activities activities which uh, society has to perform in order to continue are of different importance. Some activities are very important for the continuation of society and other activities are much less important. They believe that the more important activities need to be rewarded the more highly. If not, one would get a degeneration of society and its eventual collapse. According to the functionalist perspective, the unequal distribution of rewards is necessary if the society is to match the most talented individuals with the most challenging positions. I think the, the functionists would regard the, uh, the professions and the people who undertake high technology as particularly important for the kind of society which we have. And therefore, they think that those positions need to be particularly highly rewarded. However, critics say, Functionalism doesn't explain why people in positions of power and leadership receive excessive benefits. A stratification system is a system of power, and therefore those with, who have a, a good deal of power within that system will use it to try to increase the re rewards which they get. Chief executive officers in many cases earn uh, 400 times as much as the average employee, and certain select uh, occupations movie stars, athletes, and the like, at, at their very apex, can command tremendous salaries. Interactionism is less concerned about how stratification occurs than what happens within classes. The interactionist perspective is essential to understanding the behaviors of the status groups that form within a given class. The display of symbols by these groups is important for the interactionist. Clothing, homes, cars, language are all kinds of symbols which uh, are used to distinguish different status groups in society. Class is, is distinguished not only by how much one makes or how much education one has, but by definite markers and symbols of one's position in, in, in the social hierarchy. And the most common mark of that is one's home and where one lives. Cities are stratified by neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are stratified by size of housing, by amenities within housing, by home ownership versus renters. Hello? Some status symbols are more subtle. The particular carriages of people from various social class backgrounds, the demeanors, the assertiveness or the propensity to look away, to not look people in the eye. So these are symbols, both interpersonal as well as uh, material cultural symbols, that differentiate various social class groups. Some sociologists use the concept of face to better understand interactions between people. The concept of face is related to the status differentiation between people, and it is related to how people of higher status relate to people of lower status. Maintaining face is maintaining the status superiority which one position has over another. And even very slight offenses to status can be extremely threatening because they threaten to tumble the entire system. For example, in gangs, it is very common that this very slight affront, like accidentally bumping into a gang member, can be the cause of, of a tremendous conflict because that slight affront threatens the status position of the person and they, they, they fear that if they do not maintain their toughness in the face of this accidental bump, they will be thought to be weak and lose the status position they have in the gang. History teaches one undeniable fact about social stratification. It's unavoidable. Why is this? According to the conflict perspective, stratification exists because of inequality of power in a society. Functionalism relates stratification to society's need to differentiate rewards. And interactionism looks at shifting concepts of prestige. No matter which sociological perspective is used, Stratification is an enduring element of society. Times were hard for a lot of people in the late 1800s, and they were especially hard for those in the lower class. Horatio Alger, a popular and influential writer of this time, wrote about boys who rose from poverty to wealth and fame. These stories made him famous, 
and added to the American dream the idea of the Horatio Alger hero. Alger's books had enormous popular appeal at a time when great personal fortunes were being made and America's burgeoning industrial cities seemed to hold boundless opportunities for advancement. The phenomenon that Alger wrote about is now referred to as social mobility. Social mobility means that individuals and even entire communities can move from one stratum to another. Sociologists explore various types of social mobility, including upward mobility. Upward mobility is a movement from a lower position within a social stratification or a class system to a higher position. Upward mobility is easier to achieve in the United States because we are a class system, meaning that it's open to everyone to obtain mobility upwardly or downwardly. Social mobility can be measured either between or within generations. These two types of mobility are called intergenerational and intragenerational mobility. Intergenerational mobility would look at the individual's social class as they move up and down the strata throughout their lifetime. Intergenerational mobility does look at the parent's social class and then compare that to the child's social class. The concept of upward mobility intergenerationally, the notion that one's occupation and socioeconomic status is higher than one, the status of one's father or mother, parents. And there's also the notion of intragenerational mobility, which is the notion that within one's own life, one can move from being a, a clerk to becoming a, a bank manager, something like this. Sociologists also use structural mobility to explore movement within a society. A structural mobility is mobility which is generated by the change in social structure, the change in the occupational structure, the change of the structure of property relations. In the Great Depression, we saw a great contraction of the uh, more higher class positions in society. People lost their businesses, lost their farms, lost employment, which had been lucrative and had to take much lower kinds of occupational positions in order to survive. Structural mobility can also improve the circumstances of millions of people. Well, the computer uh, revolution has created a lot of jobs at a higher technological level and also created a lot of opportunity for earnings among people who own property in high technology industries. Those expand the number of structural positions at that level and therefore they uh, create the opportunity for movement upwards uh, due to the change in the structural uh, characteristics of society. Social mobility means that individuals and groups can move from one stratum to another. Sociologists explore the various types of mobility to gain insight into how this movement affects society. The socioeconomic ramifications of social mobility are well documented, but it often takes an emotional toll. Social mobility can be stressful and disorienting for the downwardly mobile. But that also holds true for the upwardly mobile. Elaine Bell Kaplan, now a professor of sociology at the University of Southern California, grew up as a member of a poor family. in Harlem and I lived on the sixth floor of a tenement on 129th Street between 7th and Lenox and I lived there with um, my mother and father and um, um, six brothers and sisters and we had um, we lived in um, two bedrooms and um, so it was pretty crowded. My mother and father both worked very long hours and I was the oldest child of the seven and so I was the sort of surrogate mother. I didn't want people to know that I lived in Harlem in the ghetto. The term ghetto when I was growing up was associated with a low-income black area and it carried with it a stigma. 
Being impoverished as a child meant that I was deprived in lots of ways, not just simply because we very seldom we were able to afford really great meals, but in other ways that I'm now beginning to realize really have an impact on people. For example, I have no pictures of me. We could not afford a camera, so I have no pictures of me as a child growing up, nor of any uh, of the other members of my family, because that was a luxury that we couldn't afford. In elementary school, Dr. Kaplan was greatly affected by a teacher who read books like Sleepy Hollow to the class. That really impressed me, and I thought, my God, all of this interesting material in this book, I have to read other books. And what was interesting about that is we didn't have books in my home. We didn't have books because we couldn't afford them. When I started to go to junior high school, there was an epidemic of drugs, of people becoming addicted because of drugs coming into the community. They had us very close um, relationships with about five people um, during that particular time, and four of those people died from an overdose of drugs, and the uh, other person was arrested for petty crime. I was starting to think that this is not where I want to live. I want to get out of here. This is not a safe community any longer. And the only way I could see being able to get out of that community, to leave that community, was to go to school and get an education and live in a better community. After graduating from City University of New York, Dr. Kaplan decided to continue her education in graduate school. I applied to Berkeley and it was the first school of all the 11 schools who responded to me with a letter saying, yes, we, you know, you're accepted here. When you're coming from a deprived background and you receive something like this saying, yes, we accept you, it's hard to believe that they're talking about you. So you have this fear that they're going to send you another letter a few weeks later and say to you, sorry, we made a mistake. My life has changed dramatically from my earlier life. It's like living two lives and now I'm a PhD, I'm teaching sociology, I'm doing research that I'm very, very proud of. I've been able to publish a book on black teenage mothers, and that book has had, I believe, some impact. I've gotten some very good reviews and has won an award, and people have congratulated me for opening their eyes up about the situation of black teenage mothers. So that's been very, very wonderful for me. I've been able to afford to live in a nice neighborhood, and I think I live in a very nice home. I've gotten lots of compliments about that. I'm able to send my son to a private school so that he will be able to have a very good education. And I've been able to do a lot of things for myself now that I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't acquired an education. I've talked to many people who have um, made this sort of journey out of one class to another that I have, and they all say the same thing, that they pay a price in terms of separation from their family. The family I left behind in New York really do think that I'm better than myself, that I'm no longer black, now I'm white, or I'm an Oreo, because not only did I move out of Harlem, not only did I move to an integrated area in Los Angeles, but I'm married to a Jew, which is even more interesting. So that, that really sets me apart from other blacks, as far as they're concerned. Well, one of the, the things I'm beginning to put on the plus side is that I grew up in Harlem, and that I experienced that kind of um, environment. And I think that's a plus for me now. And growing up in the ghetto gives me some status, because in order to understand the community, I should live in that community and empathize with those people. And if I'm going to write about them, I can now say, yes, I understand that situation. But the biggest disappointment to me is the estrangement with my family, the estrangement with, with the black community to a great degree that they feel uncomfortable with me, and now it's made me feel uncomfortable with them. What I really hope for my son is to be able to understand the experiences of people who are not like him. And I've talked a great deal to him about people who are poor, 
I want him to understand that he has some privileges that others do not have and that they don't have these privileges because of the structures of the society. It's not because of something they've done. In an open stratification system, social mobility offers both opportunity and risk. While downward mobility is often painful, upward mobility can take its emotional toll as well. Social stratification is society's system for ranking people according to various attributes, such as wealth, power, and prestige. Exactly what drives the creation of social strata is open to debate. It may be caused by class conflict, or by a process that rewards some segments of society, but not others. Social mobility allows people to move within a stratification system. In some cases, personal effort carries people upward. At other times, social mobility, both upward and downward, is the result of sweeping economic change. However much we try to level the playing field, social stratification appears inevitable. <laughs>